Um, but as Chris said, um, I'm responsible for our, our commercial operations at IDEX. And um, I would really like to, well, actually, I guess I have to go one slide forward because I would like to introduce you to my, my passion, the love of my life. Um, this is Gabriella. And Gabriella is actually featured here enjoying the main coastline. And this is after having lived in uh, the Netherlands and Germany for the last seven plus years with my husband and I. All three of us are now living back in the United States. And Gabriella is um, enjoying her, her new surroundings. She's a 12 and a half year old toy poodle. She's from Germany. She is very ha healthy happy and well cared for. And I'll, as I'll talk about in, in part of uh, my presentation, I am certainly not the only pet parent in the world who thinks that way about their baby. So first of all, we're gonna start um, with the evolution of the pet owner. Um, now what you're gonna see is I'm gonna quote actually a lot of, dat a lot of data. Much of the data is US based However, we see the same phenomena in across the whole globe and protect, particularly in Western and more developed nations. Um, as Nancy said earlier, and I love this phrase, she said, the next gen is the pet gen. And that could not have been a better lead in to what I'm going to talk about and, and where we see our future going. So first of all, if anyone had any doubts, Pets are truly part of our family. Um, they sleep in our beds. They're featured in all of our family photos. They're cared for. They attend events. Gabriella not only attended a wedding, but her name was actually on the wedding invitation. Um, 95, we treat them like children, right? We treat them like members of our family. And 95% of pet owners surveyed said, I couldn't imagine giving up my pet for any reason. And those reasons do, of course, include illness and death. Now, we all know from multiple surveys and multiple medical studies that pets have a positive impact on our mental health, our physical well being. And it's evidenced by emotional support and therapy animals, um, the fact that pet owners tend to have lower blood pressure, um, pets used for stress relief at IDEX's international headquarters in uh, Amsterdam, we are a, a pet-friendly facility. And the amount of daily pet therapy that goes on is amazing, particularly in our customer support team, where they're talking to veterinarians and they're talking to, to people who are a little bit upset every day because maybe there's a problem with a product you know, we make fabulous products, but sometimes things break. They've got questions about a difficult case. And, and the pets really provide wonderful, wonderful stress relief, in addition to just being, you know, just having that fabulous bond. Um, but interestingly, you know, we know that from various studies, but this is self-reported. And what you see is that the younger generation, the next, uh, gen pet generation thinks that pets have a positive impact on their mental health more than any other generation that we've seen. And now this is really important because millennials and Gen Z, they are gonna be nearly 60% of all pet owners by 2025. And so if we think about that and we think about how we have to look at the business and veterinary practices in just the next five, six years, that's a really important clientele that we have to make sure we can address and address properly and think about how they want to be treated as consumers. Now, for example, very interestingly, more than any other generation, the younger generation also believes that their pets have special needs. 42% of those surveyed, you think about that, that's a really big number, say, my pet's different, my pet's special, and he or she has very special needs. But what I think is fabulous is 
that 75% of them also rely on their veterinarian for medical advice and for advice about medicines and food. Now, I find this very interesting. First of all, I think it's great news because there were questions earlier about, well, will AI replace a veterinarian and, and will, will, will people still need veterinarians? Well, of course. But this is the digital social media generation that goes to Dr. Google, but they still want to hear from a, a real live veterinarian about what's best for their pet, because 42% of them have special needs. This younger generation is also willing to spend more money on their pets. And they're willing to make more financial trade-offs for both pet products and services. And this also includes veterinary services. Now, we actually have quite a bit of data around what type of, uh, what people will give up to pay for their pets. But I think this is just a great slide that shows it effectively, because it essentially says 41% are willing to make a financial trade-off to pay for products and services. But then look at the, the percentage, 50%, 30% of people who have spent 50 or $75 or more on their pet in the past 30 days. And so this is really important because a lot of, and you all know, right, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, <coughs> preaching to the choir, a lot of veterinarians will say pet you know, owners don't want to pay for diagnostics or they don't want to pay for certain treatments. They, they don't want to pay. Well, they do. And, and we've got more and more data that shows that, that pet owners will pay for products and services that they see value in. And for example, we know in Europe that pet owners spend five times more on their pet food than American pet owners. Interesting. And that's because across Europe, pet food is, tends to be more organic. People treat, you know, go for more organic and natural ingredients. Matter of fact, Sweden is number one, and they spend, the Swedish spend 12 times more on pet food than America, which I find very interesting. So the willingness to spend on our pets was there. And we talked a little bit this morning about the Fitbark app and some others, other wearables. This is further evidence of pet owners, pet owners' willingness to spend money on their pets, but also their desire to understand the health and well-being of their pet. However, while the, generation, while the younger generation still looks to veterinarians for advice, what we're starting to see is this is preliminary da data, but they're starting to uh, choose alternative channels for more of their routine or preventative care. And this being is the evolution of clinics and pet stores, which isn't that new, but we're seeing more mobile facilities and we're seeing veterinary clinics that are popping up in feed stores, home and garden. You heard Walmart. And this is a phenomenon which is more prevalent in the US, but we're seeing it move to all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of countries in Europe. It's becoming very prevalent in the Netherlands, as a matter of fact. And we're also starting to see it in Latin America and parts of Asia. So I think that's really important because we say, well then, why do they look at these routine channels? Well, it really appears to be, and Nancy talked about it this morning, is it really seems to be a lot around convenience. So they still want the vet. They still want to talk to a vet but they want it on their terms. They want it to be convenient. Uh, the fact that people would like to have a vet visit their home or their workplace or something that makes it more convenient is pretty important that we need to think of. But this is something that traditional veterinary practices and facilities could certainly address to attract this very important growing clientele. Even just opening hours and the way we communicate with the pet owner is, is a way to bring them in and keep them loyal to the clinic. I think the comment that was made this morning, understanding their needs and not stealing their time. So it's interesting to know the data, but certainly it's not too late to do something different about it. But in spite the caring, despite all the caring and the willingness of pet owners to pay, we also know that, again, this is US data, that only 50% of dogs and 20% of cats are actually getting annual wellness visits 
at their veterinary practice. Um, so what do we think this number is in the UK? Do we think it's higher? Do we think it's lower? You think it's higher? Oh, that's interesting. OK. I would have argued it was lower based on what we see. But if it is higher, that would be a great thing. And that would be something that, that we could build upon. Um, and I would say, what, so then what do we do about it? Even if it's 60% or 70%, what do we do about it? Because we were talking about the innovation. So much of the innovation that we're seeing and hearing and all the wearables and, and the apps are really about wellness, right? How do I detect how, how healthy my pet is? So pet owners want prevention. They want to, to do wellness. But maybe they don't know that they can get this directly from their vet. Maybe they don't realize that when they go to their vet, they, they can have blood work drawn. They can have a baseline. They could understand how healthy their pet is, as opposed to only taking the pet in for uh, a shot, you know, for a, a vaccination, a rabies vaccination, or for, um, you know, when the pet is sick. So I think it really gives us uh, gives us an opportunity to take it to the next level. So now I'll switch to kind of the second part of the topic and speak a little bit about what IDEX is doing relative to innovation around diagnostics and what we're doing to help the industry. Now, I am going to speak to you today about what's available and, and how we could use what's available um, to help improve the health and well-being of pets, but also how to improve the health and well-being of your practice. And so while I'm not here to give a paid advertisement or an advertisement to IDEX, we happen to be the leaders in the diagnostic industry, so that will be the data and the information that, that I'll share with you. So first of all, we talk about technology and innovation. As a company, IDEX believes very, very strongly in investment in innovation. Um, over the past, well, this goes back to 2012, but you could go back to the past 20 years, um, we've invested more than 80% of the diagnostic industry R&D. And we continue every year to spend more and more money on research and development because we believe it's so critical. We believe uh, innovation and bringing new products and technologies to the veterinary community is the absolute best way for us as a manufacturer and as a business partner to help you increase and improve standards of care. Um, we want to make it easier to, for the veterinary professional as well as for the pet owner to uh, provide the best possible care for our beloved family members, uh, to keep them as healthy and happy for as long as possible, which is ultimately what we want. This year, that spending on R&D is going to be close to $150 million. So we continue to ratchet up that investment. But what do we spend it on? Well, we spend it on a lot of things. But I just want to talk about two things that, are, that, that use the innovation that, that bring value to the clinics. The first way we use innovation, and these are all of our products over here, um, but the first way we, we do it is by uh, developing our in-house or in-clinic veterinary products so that you actually have a full suite of veterinary of, of products where you can do in-clinic testing. So when the pet is there, they're under the weather, they're sick, you can test, you can treat, and, and have everything at your fingertips. Um, but we've used the R&D to develop the most comprehensive test menu available, including our proprietary SDMA, as well as putting retic hemoglobin on our ProSite hematology analyzer, and developing a urine sediment analyzer. Now, I won't talk to you in depth about SETIVIEW, but what I will tell you is that SETIVIEW uses AI, and it uses the same facial recognition technology to recognize bacteria, crystals, and whatever else is in the urine. And what's fabulous about that and the way we've used artificial intelligence is that instrument gets smarter and smarter every single time urine is run in it. So the more patients it sees, the smarter it gets. So that's a practical example of how one company in the industry is actually using AI today and making it available. So when somebody said AI is here, 
yeah, it's here and it's in some of the products that are sitting in many of your clinics. A second example that I think is quite important that I want to spend a little time talking about of how we use innovation is to expand the utility of both the in-clinic instrument suite and also our reference lab, because we also have a reference lab. Um, all of these products and our reference lab are actually connected through two-way integration, and it's a proprietary two-way integration uh, software solution. And it integrates not only to the products, but to VetConnect Plus, to virtually all the practice management, um, practice information management systems, and really allows, allows that integration, and we make it available to clinics at no additional cost. So if you're using the instruments, you're using the reference lab, the integration is part of, is part of the package. And this is really important because what we're trying to do is give you the opportunity of either running your diagnostic tests in your clinic or sending it to the reference lab. But this way, you've got consistent results in the clinics. The integration allows for you to order online, making it much more efficient, view results online, trend results, and also share results with other colleagues or with pet owners. So this morning when Madison was talking about Innovet and she was showing trending that could be shared on, on, her, on her app, well, you can do the same thing with the technology that's available to you today through Vet Connect Plus and really allow improved efficiency in order to spend more time, um, you know, more time caring for the pets, but also giving your clients the types of, of information that they're asking for. So that's good, but how does that help your practice be healthier? Well, first of all, as a result of our holistic offering and just easier information management, we see that in the US, as an example, that veterinary practices that use IDEX grow at a higher rate or a faster rate than other practices. And it's over five years, so it's statistically significant. But what about the UK? Oh, that did not part over. That did not pour it over well. Well, I'll tell you what that says. Um, that actually says that in the UK, I talked a little bit about integration, electronic lab requisitions, two-way integration, viewing results in VetConnect Plus. Those practices that are fully integrated, which again, the integration is at no charge, grow at a much, much faster rate than those practices that are not integrated. As a matter of fact, um, those practices that are, that are integrated grow 18% higher year over year, but those that have been integrated for more than a year are showing almost 30% higher growth year over year. So that just shows that your clinics actually adopt the technology, use it more, and grow more. But, and then anyone, any practices that also are fully integrated and use the Anamana practice management system actually have grown 30%, 32%. So again, it just shows how this actually makes it easier for you to detect diseases, monitor them and treat them, and grow the practice as well as improve patient care. But I think what's really important for today as well is those practices here in the UK that are not integrated, they might be using our instruments, but they're not integrated, are actually declining a little bit year over year. And that's because these are the practices that are not embracing innovation and technology. And I think that's really important. Um, fortunately, over 50% of the practices are embracing the technology, but it's simply an example of allowing ourselves to be left behind when the technology is available. And what's great about it is it's very easy to use. So even a one or two person clinic can use it uh, without too much difficulty. Now, another example of innovation here in the UK is that we're really seeing extraordinary growth in specialty chemistry. And that's things like SDMA, T4, fructosamine, CRP. And I think this is important because this innovation helps increase the standards of care. And we're seeing that, that as you see more pets presenting who are sick, you're, you're needing to use these new tools to be able to give better care. So that's also very exciting. 
Um, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit to talk about the fact that that R&D money that we spend extends into the um, development of multiple different practice management systems that are cl cloud-based that we offer today uh, around the world. And I think what's even more important than the fact that, okay, we, we have a cloud-based PIM, that's nice, but what's even more important is that we're accelerating not only the development of the cloud-based PIMs, but we're spending a significant amount of money to actually integrate a number of different apps that are available. We don't necessarily make all of these apps. Some of these develop. We develop. Other times, we simply develop the engine, and we work with third-party application providers. And we bring it all together to you in an easy-to-use package. And you can see it's around client engagement, wellness, practice intelligent, also helping you with clinical workflow. So again, making it easier for you to address the needs of what's becoming a more and more demanding and more sophisticated pet owner population. And the millennials, as we talked about, that have no issue and no difficulty using any of these applications, whether they're your clients or whether they're your, your new veterinarians and your new vet nurses. And then another innovation that, again, goes into um, the investment is smart flow. This product optimizes your common workflow patterns, and it's embedded in Anamana, but it's also embedded in EasyVet, which we know is a very common, very popular practice management system in the UK. And it captures your records and the charges along the way. Again, helping you practice, practice better, better medicine, but also helping you with a healthier uh, business practice. So now, the last area that I'd like to touch on is preventative care. Because we talked about the desires of the pet owners to have, make sure that their pets are well. So when we speak about preventative care or wellness testing, this can sometimes be controversial. And we're not talking about it because we want, you to, we want to spend more money and sell more diagnostics or have this be just about money. We're speaking from conviction because there have been repeated studies around the world that are giving us similar conclusions. Adding blood tests to a wellness visit helps find problems earlier. And this is just another example or one example of how we're using big data at IDEX to bring value to the industry. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. But as a, as a result of the data that we've that we've collated and the studies that have, been, uh, that have been done in Australia, the US, and other countries, we've developed a preventative care or a wellness protocol. And that includes Chem 22, CBC with reticulocytes, uh, vector-borne disease, 4DX, and fecal testing for adult dogs. So when you run that, what do you see? And I think this is why, why we feel so strongly about how you can help your pets, your, your pet owners, keep their pets well. Because in a sample of over 30,000 dogs, which is statistically significant, it's quite a, large, quite a large survey, we see that when the preventative care protocol is run on a seemingly healthy dog, pet comes in totally non-symptomatic, that we find three or more statistically significant findings, uh, clinically significant findings in one out of four senior and adult dogs. And it becomes even higher as the dogs get older, up to, one in, up to one in two. Now, as we dig deeper in this data, and we've got a significant amount of data, we do admittedly see that what you find changes based on the age of the pet. But they're all very relevant. So as an example, here in the UK and in continental Europe, we do see a little bit less heartworm we do see a little bit less or different vector-borne diseases. But we see as many, if not more, clinical signs um, when the chemistry and the CBC tests are run. So for this reason, it's, it's really important. And we also believe that that's why some of the specialty tests that, that are being adopted, because you're finding more. So this data certainly um, supports running diagnostic testing on sick pets but it also supports running it on healthy pets. And I talk, I talk about this because, again, we've got the technology to help make it easier for you, but also given that pet owners want to understand the health status of their pets, 
it's the only place that they can, that, that blood can be drawn. You're the professionals. You can draw the blood and you can give them the, um, the medical advice and recommendation that they desire. So again, another example of bringing, um, bringing that technology to the market. So I'm just gonna end with just uh, the last two or three points that we talk about, you know, the importance of, of diagnosing and understanding, understanding the, the health of a pet. But we do see that even in the US, where, where there is um, where, where, where there are where there is more testing, that only 17% of clinical visits include blood work. Yet pet owners want to know the, the status of their of their pet. But internationally, the data shows it's anywhere from four to eight percent. And the UK and Australia are more like eight percent. Germany is just slightly below that. And so I think about this in the context of what was discussed this morning. Consumers are putting collars on their dogs, right? Trying to understand the health status, yet, yet that's actually more expensive than coming to you and getting a holistic, a holistic visit. So I think it's important that we kind of think about that and think about how we can, can use blood work and diagnostics and the innovation and the technology that's available to address the changing needs and the rapidly evolving um, needs of the millennial pet owners. So I won't go into the data here. I will simply say that we've got a 25-year generational macro trend ahead of us that we can do a lot collectively, um, collectively to address by working together to providing and using the technology that's available and that's coming down the road to really take care of our pets and, and the pet owners. So thank you very much for your time today. And on behalf of Gabriella, who is very healthy and happy, thanks to the veterinary industry, she thanks you all as well.